Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Anna Simon. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame. I do research in experimental nuclear astrophysics and today I want to tell you a little bit about things I do and I'll tell you about how elements are produced in stellar environments. Okay, so if we think about the evolution of our universe that started with a Big Bang, within the first one second uh, after the Big Bang, protons and neutrons were created, and it took another uh, three minutes to produce uh, hydrogen and helium nuclei. Uh, that then, uh, after the uh, universe uh, kept cooling down, uh, within the next 300,000 years formed hydrogen atoms and helium atoms. After that, it took billions of years to create the universe we know right now with galaxies and stars like we can see in our uh, sky. So like I said, the during the first three minutes, only three elements were created. That's hydrogen, helium, and lithium. And if you look at the periodic chart of elements, we have a huge variety of elements uh, from the lightest hy hydrogen and helium uh, through metals that we know, uh, iron, copper, and nickel, to very heavy stuff like uranium. So the question is how all these elements were created during the evolution of the universe. Do we really care? Is that an important question? Well, it is. Uh, if you uh, ask the National Research Council, which is a committee that decides what are the most important questions uh, researchers should uh, answer, uh, one of the questions they posted was, how were the heavy elements from iron to uranium made? So we do need to figure that out. And what I will be talking about are processes that happen on the level of atomic nucleus. That's 10 to negative 14 of a meter. That's a very small object that we can't really see. And what happens on the scale of the atomic nucleus actually governs what happens in the whole universe. So it will de decide on the processes that happen on the scale of our galaxy, for example, that's 10 to 20 meters. So whatever happens in a nucleus will decide on what's happening in the whole universe. But to describe the nuclear physics behind the production of heavy elements, I'm not going to use the periodic chart of elements. I'll use the version that nuclear physicists typically use, which is a chart of nucleus. And here on the uh, vertical axis, you have a number of protons, which is basically uh, the atomic number, which uh, gives you uh, what element you're talking about. So on the very bottom, the first gray square, that's hydrogen with one proton. The next row is helium with two protons. And then we can go on and on until we reach the heaviest uh, one leveled here, that's gold with 79 protons. On the horizontal axis, we have a number of neutrons. Each of the elements has a fixed number of protons. That's how we uh, figure out what type of element it is. But it can have a wide variety of neutrons in the nucleus. And each of the squares here uh, describes a different isotope of an element, so a different uh, version of, of the element. And again, for example, for hydrogen, we have uh, pure hydrogen, which is just a, a single proton. The next gray uh, square and the, in, on the very bottom here, that's deuteron. That is a combination of one proton and one neutron. And the third one is uh, tritium, which is proton with two neutrons. So each row, again, uh, corresponds to one element, and each of the squares describes a different isotope of that element. 
the shaded gray squares are the, uh, are the stable elements or the stable isotopes that we know exist on Earth. The, the empty squares are what's called radioactive or unstable nuclei that have a certain uh, half-life, which means that after a certain time, of, uh, they will decay uh, into a different element, probably more stable one. And in, in time, they will decay uh, to something uh, that, that's more stable or, or that is stable. OK, let's go back to the uh, evolution of a star. So after the first three minutes of the uh, life of the universe, our universe was basically a large cloud of gas. That gas started uh, contracting and under its own gravitational uh, field. And first stars were formed. So you can imagine this huge clouds of gas slowly compressing uh, to form a first star. Uh, at the, the first stage of that evolution that's called a protostar, that's when the nuclear processes start in that uh, cloud of gas. And the energy released from those nuclear processes is what makes the star shine and what makes it visible for us in the sky. Now, the life cycle of the star will depend on how large that star is. If it's very small, uh, the nuclear processes inside that uh, star will end very quickly and will end up with a black, uh, with a brown dwarf. If that star is large enough, it will become what's called a main sequence star, like for example, our sun. And it will go through several, what's called burning stages that I will talk about in a, in a second. And will have several different uh, paths. It can turn into a red giant that will blow up the outer layers and turn, turn into a white dwarf. Or if it's large enough, it will explode as a supernova that can then form a neutron star or a black hole. And the, uh, the parts of the supernova that are uh, expelled during the explosion will feed the interstellar gas to form another nebula that will again be a, a beginning of a new star. So that cycle will repeat uh, throughout the whole evolution of the universe. Let's talk about a star that we know the best, which is our sun. Uh, it's 150 million kilometers away from us. It's a very hot object. It's almost 6,000 Kelvin. Its mass of 10 to the 30th of a kilogram uh, is the typical unit that we use uh, to describe masses of other stars. So from now on, when I will talk about stars and their masses, I will call them in the units of a solar mass. So if, some, if a star has a mass of five solar masses, it means that it's five times heavier than our sun. Now, if we look at the uh, elements that are present in the sun, for one million of hydrogen atoms in the sun, we have only about 100,000 of helium atoms, and then several hundreds of oxygen, carbon, and neon, and very few uh, cases of other elements. And by mass, our sun is made of 70% of hydrogen and roughly 26% of helium. So if we look at the evolution of sun right now, it's about four and a half billion years since the sun uh, ignite. So we're halfway through its life cycle. Uh, sun is the main uh, sequence star that will end up as a red giant, but that will not happen for the next about four or five billion years. And at that time, sun will increase its volume uh, it will expel the uh, cooler outer layers and will end up as a white dwarf. Okay. So in general, when we think about evolution of the star, we start from a cloud of hydrogen that when it's contracted into a volume of a high temperature and density, uh, high enough 
that the nuclear processes can start, that hydrogen is burned into helium. And I'm not going into the details of the complex reactions that are happening there, but in, in general, the hydrogen uh, atoms in that gas are, are converted into helium. And that process will keep going until we basically run out of hydrogen. We end up with a core or the center of that, of that cloud uh, full of helium. And then to initialize the next burning stage of, uh, of that gas, the volume of that, uh, of that star has to decrease again so that it's kind of compressed. So the temperature and density increase again to trigger the next burning stage. So we're now burning helium. And during that stage, helium will burn into carbon. And again, when we run out of helium, uh, the nuclear processes will slow down. So the gravitational forces will compress that cloud again uh, even farther so that the carbon can burn into oxygen. And then the next stage, oxygen will burn into silicon and silicon will burn into iron. That iron will form a dense core inside a star that cannot be burned, in, burned into heavier elements. And I will get to that in a second. Uh, so once that core forms, we stop uh, all the burning processes. The gravitational forces will again start contracting the whole object toward that core forming a very dense and hot center that then explodes as a supernova. Okay. So as a summary, we have this onion-like structure of a star. In this case, for example, a 25 solar mass star, so an object 25 times heavier than our sun. That, that type of star will go through all these burning processes, forming all the elements up to iron. And then once iron core is formed, it will explode, expelling the outer layers into the, uh, the uh, interstellar medium so that new stars can be formed. Uh, stars that are smaller than eight times the, the mass of sun will never ignite carbon burning. They will follow the path of our sun and they will turn into a red giant. So only stars above eight masses of sun will actually go through uh, the, the farther burning stages and may end up as a supernova. So if we go back to the chart of nucleids, we started with hydrogen and helium uh, on the very bottom of, of the chart. During the helium burning, we formed carbon that then was uh, converted into oxygen that was co converted into silicon and finally, we ended up with nickel and iron 56. And that's where the burning processes in the star stop. And we're only one third through the chart of nucleus. So we still have to figure out what happens uh, with the elements above iron and how all those elements are created. Now, why do, does the stellar burning stop at iron? Basically, because nature is lazy. We, if you look at the plot here, we have what's called an average binding energy per nucleon, which tells you how strongly bound a nucleus is. On the x-axis, we have a number of nucleons in the nucleus. Uh, so this is a plot of the binding energy uh, for all the elements that, that we know. And this one is a little tricky to read, so I'll flip it. And now you can see that the iron is on the very bottom of this plot, which means that that's the most comfortable spot for all the elements to be. So all the elements would like to be an iron that's best, uh, that's mostly bound uh, element that we know. If we look to the left, the same situation happens around helium-4 or carbon-12 or oxygen-16. And that, if you remember, are the points where the burning stages stopped. That means that at this nuclei, we have to add extra energy to form the heavier elements uh, to continue the burning stages. At iron, if we wanted to create heavier elements, we would also have to add 
more energy to the system. That means that instead of a star shining because of the energy released during uh, the burning uh, of, of the elements, you would have to actually add energy to the system uh, to produce new elements. And that's not possible. So if the nature wants to uh, create iron and everything wants to go to iron, is the universe made of iron? Luckily, it's not. And here is a plot of abundances of all the elements uh, as a function of their mass number. And everything here is normalized to a million of atoms of silicon. So if you look at the spike for silicon, that's at 10 to the power of 6. That's 1 million of silicon atoms. For all the elements that were produced during the burning stages, we have those spikes showing that that's where the uh, burning stages stopped. That's why we have the maximum. We have a spike at iron. That's where the burning stages stop for all the, all the stars. But we also have a lot of elements uh, that are heavier than iron. They're not as abundant as the uh, light ones, but there's a large variety of them. And there's a lot of structure in there suggesting that there are multiple processes that uh, produce those elements. So how can those elements be created? First, if we want to capture a particle into an iron, we need to add energy. So that's something that cannot really happen in, uh, during a burning stage. A capture of a charged particle is not very likely, because if you think about two nuclei, they're both positively charged. So if we put them close together, they will repel each other. It's not very, so it's very difficult to make them stick together to form a new atom. But that doesn't apply to neutrons. Neutrons are uh, negative, are, don't carry an electric charge. That's why they're called neutrons. So we can easily stick them uh, to a nucleus because the, the Coulomb repulsion will not uh, interfere. And there are two processes that happen in the stellar environments uh, that involve neutron capture. One of them is called S for slow neutron capture. The other one is rapid for rapid neutron capture. So if we imagine we have a nucleus that was formed during an earlier burning stages of, uh, of that star, and that nucleus happens to capture a neutron, well, most likely end up with something that's unstable. And that unstable nucleus will beta decay uh, to a stable one. And during the beta decay, that excessive neutron is converted into a proton. So we're creating an element with one more proton than the initial one. Uh, that's probably going to be stable. Now, what does it mean that the process is slow? Well, the time scale of the uh, slow neutron capture is governed by the half-life of the elements, of the, of the uh, isotopes that are produced. If that half-life is very long, uh, if, so, I'm getting confused here. If uh, the rate of the neutrons that are in the environment is very low, and the time it takes to capture another neutron uh, is much longer than the half-life of the isotope that we produced, we call the process slow. That means that within one life cycle of an uh, isotope, a nucleus, uh, it's very unlikely for it to capture more than one neutron. And let's go back to the chart of nucleus. At the very bottom, at the bottom, I have iron 56 that was produced during the burning stages of, of a star. And now, if that iron 56 captures a neutron, we'll produce the next. I, whoops. There we go. We'll produce the next uh, isotope of iron, which is iron 57. Now that iron 57 is again stable, so it will wait there 
until it can capture another neutron, producing iron-56, which is again stable, which will have enough time to wait for, a new, for the next neutron to capture. Now, iron-56 that's produced is unstable, and most likely it will decay before it gets a chance to capture a new uh, a next neutron. So that one will be decay into the next element, which is cobalt-59. Cobalt-59 is, is stable, so it will wait to capture another neutron. Cobalt-60 is unstable, so it will beta decay. And we can go like this, producing a whole uh, variety of stable elements that are heavier than uh, iron that we know exist in the universe. So where does the S process happen? Well, if you, for example, look at the Orion constellation, there will be a slightly reddish star in, in that constellation, that's Betelgeuse. That's where the S process is happening right now. How do we know that? If we look at the spectrum emitted from that star, we can see lines corresponding to technetium. Technetium is a heavy element, heavier than iron, but it has a half-life of 4 million years. So if it was formed before that star was born, most likely it would have decayed uh, by now, if, even before the hydrogen burning phase of that star was over. The fact that technetium exists in the star means that it has to be produced within that star during its lifetime. So now the other process, the rapid neutron capture, the difference between the rapid and slow process is the intensity of the neutron flux. In this case, our initial nucleus is bombarded with a high flux of neutrons, which means that the probability of capturing a neutron is very high, and that initial nucleus can capture multiple neutrons before it undergoes beta decay. So we start again with a nucleus with a given number of protons and neutrons, capture one neutron, immediately can capture another one, and then maybe we'll produce an isotope that's very unstable and that will immediately beta decay to produce uh, something, uh, produce a new element. Again, that will make more sense if I show it on the chart of nucleus. Again, we'll start from iron 56. We're exposing iron 56 to a large flux of neutrons so that nucleus immediately captures a lot of them, producing very exotic, very unstable iron 70. That iron 70 is very unstable and it will immediately beta decay to cobalt 70. That, is, that has a little longer half-life, so that get a chance uh, to capture a neutron. Cobalt-71 will de beta decay to nickel-71. And that path continues, and we are producing very exotic, very unstable nuclei far away from the stability. Now, when the flux of neutrons stops, all those unstable nuclei that we produced will beta decay to stability, producing, again, stable nuclei that we know exist. And this process can produce, for example, in this case, germanium-76 or zinc-70 that could not be accessed by the S process, but in this case, they're produced. So if we look at the whole chart of nucleids, blue lines here show you the path of the R process. So the synthesis of the R process nuclei goes very far away from stability to very exotic nuclei with very short half-lives to the regions of chart of nucleus that we know very little about. And I have a short video to show you how that process happens. We start with uh, here populated a little bit. So we start with an initial population around iron uh, isotopes. 
when the neutron flux starts, we're quickly producing a lot of isotopes far away from stability. I'll let them populate. There we go. So we're going into very exotic, very heavy uh, nuclei. And now when the flux of neutrons stops, the, all these nuclei are beta decaying back to stability, producing all the stable elements. Okay. And this, this part of the movie is not very fascinating. So we'll quickly jump to stability. And if you look at the plot here, the red squares show the higher abundance of uh, produced elements. And if you remember the plot of abundances I showed you, that one had two spikes in the high and uh, high masses. This, this is where those spikes come from. So again, where does the R process happen? It has to be an environment with a lot of neutrons. Uh, it has to be an environment that already has iron as a seed for that process. So there are several possibilities uh, that where the R process could happen. One is a neutron star merger, where you have two, uh, where you have a neutron star, which is obviously full of neutrons that you can use uh, for the R process. Another uh, possibility is what's called the wind, uh, close to the core of a uh, core collapse supernova, like, like the one I showed you an evolution of earlier, where again you have a lot of lighter elements that can be a seed for the R process, and a lot of neutrons, high energy neutrons, that are ex uh, released during the explosion that can be used for the R process. Now, where does the nuclear physics come into play here? Well, we we're talking about processes that happen on very exotic, unstable nuclei that don't really exist in nature in, uh, on, on Earth. So the only way we can study them is to produce them in a laboratory. And for that one, we, have, for example, have FRIP as, at Michigan State University, where beams of exotic nuclei can be produced for nuclear physicists to study. And right now, uh, the part shaded here in gray of the lab is being built. Uh, so for Current research, we have two cyclotrons that can produce a variety of beams and that are used in many different experiments where we can figure out what are the half-lives of those nuclei, what are the masses of those nuclei, what are the probabilities of them reacting with other nuclei so we can determine what types of reactions are possible uh, for the given uh, element. The new part of the of the building that's going to come up online within the next five years or so. Uh, that's a linear accelerator that will be uh, able to produce very high intensities of very exotic beams uh, that we cannot produce in the lab right now. The new effort facility will be able to produce beams of radioactive elements that are on the path of the air, our process. So the very exotic stuff that we'll finally be able to uh, study to figure out what are the properties and if uh, and to answer the questions about the stellar uh, nucleosynthesis and if our understanding of that process is correct. So right now, if you go to Michigan State, you will see things like that, a lot of construction going on, a lot of uh, heavy machinery uh, building uh, the new accelerator on site and hopefully within the next five years we'll get beams and we'll be able to study uh, the very exotic nuclei. So the story I gave you here looks like we know a lot about the nucle uh, uh, nuclear astrophysics and how the elements are produced. Uh, so why do we still build facilities like this? Well, first, 
the two processes that I talked about are just a small fraction of what really happens in uh, the stellar environments. If you look at the, the charts on the bottom, there's a lot of processes that happen uh, in the stars uh, that lead to production of, very, of various um, regions of, of elements. I talked only about the S and R processes, but there are also processes that happen on the, what I would call the other side of stability, so on the proton-rich side of the chart of nuclides. And in all this, those cases, we don't know the half-lives of, of the elements. We don't know the re, uh, reaction probabilities. And the farther away we go from stability, the less we know about them. So we need facilities like AFRIB to answer all those questions, because the only way we can describe the, uh, the properties of a nuclear right now is through theories. And theories, though they, they work very well, they still may be incorrect. They may have a huge uncertainty uh, in all their predictions. So we need those experimental uh, results to figure out how good the theory is, to constrain the theory, so that we are able to better describe the stellar uh, nucleosynthesis. OK, I think I will stop here. And I will take questions. <coughs> While we're waiting for the Wisconsin classroom to catch up, I know there's a little bit of a delay in the feed. Can you explain uh, uh, why you decided to go into nuclear astrophysics? Well, wow, that's an interesting question. Uh, because I was curious. I wanted to know what's happening in the stars. And when I look at the sky, I can see all the stars in there. And I always wanted to know why they shine, what's going on in there, and how, how the whole universe evolved to be the way it is. And the answer is in the nuclear physics. So that's, that's why I wanted to go into it and, and figure it all out. What advice do you have for high school students who might want to study physics? Be curious about it and don't give up. When I was in high school and I, uh, when I uh, had my first quiz, that was the most difficult test I've ever taken. And then I thought, like, I need to figure it all out. It's, it cannot be that difficult. And that's what got me going. So just be curious, ask, ask questions, and it, it's all really interesting. How did the particles get through our atmosphere without burning up? <sighs> um, well, before, so the elements that we see on Earth were formed before the actual Earth was, was formed. So probably what happened is that before our stellar, uh, or our solar system was formed, there was another star that produced all the elements that we know exist right now. And what our sun and our solar system are, are the remnants of the elements that, are, that were produced by that star. So when that, that star probably a supernova exploded, forming a new nebula from which the sun and the planets surrounding it formed. Uh, that was way before uh, Earth existed, atmosphere existed. Uh, so they did not really have to go through the atmosphere of our Earth, but they were already there when the Earth was forming. Are there any elements created in our atmosphere? Well, yeah, so our atmosphere is constantly bombarded by uh, cosmic rays. So there are still uh, nuclear reactions happening in there, and there will be uh, elements still produced in the atmosphere. 
why isn't the value of stability a linear? Why does it have the shape it does? What does the, that reflect about the nucleus? Well, so the, the nucleus, as we know, is held together by nuclear forces. So if you put a proton and neutron close together, the force that holds them is a, uh, is a uh, nuclear force. Now, if you keep adding protons to a nucleus, those protons are electrically charged and they will be expelling it, uh, each other. So to compensate for that, you need to add more neutrons. That will be a source of uh, the nuclear force that will hold the nucleus together. So the heavier element you produce, the more neutrons you have to have in there to keep it all together. So that's why for the heavier nuclei, the uh, value of stability kind of diverges towards more neutron rich uh, isotopes. More questions? What is the one question in research you would like to answer? Well, I told you about the production of heavy elements through neutron capture, but those processes do not produce all of the heavy uh, isotopes that we know. There is actually a small fraction of heavy isotopes uh, that cannot be produced by S, S and R processes. And what I work on is actually the P process, which is a process uh, that produces those proton-rich uh, stable nuclei. So what I'm working on is a very small, less than 1% fraction of all the elements that we know that we don't really understand where they're coming from. Yeah, uh, were other planets in our solar system formed by the same elements that formed our planet? Yes. If you look at uh, Mars, if you look at Jupiter, they will contain the same elements as we know on Earth. That's why we have water on Mars that we recently discovered. Why is Jupiter then a gas planet, whereas Earth is rocky? That's a tricky question. I am not an astrophysicist, uh, I'm a nuclear physicist. <laughs> what is the, the greatest discovery you've made to date in your research? Or the most interesting to you? Huh. That's, that's a good question. Uh, so what I do for a living is measuring cross sections of probabilities for uh, reactions that happen on the proton rich uh, isotopes. And what I try to uh, achieve is a way of constraining the theoretical predictions for those cross sections. So it's, it's very uh, satisfying if you measure a set of reactions and then compare them with several theories that are available on the market. And then you're able to pick one and then tell people that that's the one you, you're supposed to use if you're talking about P process uh, calculations, for example. So that, that's, uh, that's what I do, and that, that's what I uh, think was most interesting. What are some ways that this basic research helps us on, whoops, I lost the question. Daily basis. On daily basis. So I'm talking about nuclear reactions uh, that we, since we know how to uh, harness them, we can use, for example, to produce energy uh, that, that can be used uh, in our daily life. So we have nuclear power plants that are based on the same principles that we uh, investigate for stellar environments. 
we can use uh, the radioactive nuclei that we produce in the labs, for example, for uh, medical purposes. We can use them for treatments of cancer. We can also uh, use them for diagnostics. We can inject uh, radioactive materials uh, into a patient to see uh, where tumors or uh, other structures occur in, uh, in the human body. So there's a lot of intersection between uh, basic research and, and our everyday life. So the S process happens uh, in most likely red giants, where it, it's a long uh, process that takes billions of years uh, to, to, to produce all, all the elements. Because if you look at the half-lives of the element of the isotopes that are produced that live close to stability, they're on the orders of millions of years. So each of those steps of the S process will take millions of years uh, to, to happen. Recap what you said earlier. What inspired you to become a scientist? Do you have any pearls of wisdom for us as we were deciding what to do with our lives? Well, I like to play with things. I like to break things and I like putting things together and disassembling them and figuring out how they work. And that's what I do for a living. I'm an experimentalist, so I have a lab with a lot of equipment, a lot of electronics that I can put together, uh, assemble, disassemble, continuously improve, and then use it for my research, measure something, and then figure out how I can measure them better, improve things. Uh, so I get to play with things on the daily basis. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and have a nice day.